Hello, Portland, Oregon. You're watching another entertaining episode of TV Toastmasters. My name is Teresa Griffin Kennedy. I'm a Portland writer and author. And today's show, we're going to be talking about writing. I have a very special guest for today's show. He is a writer and an author in his own right. And he also happens to be my husband. His name is Don Dupay. He's written Behind the Badge in River City, a Portland Police memoir, which debuted in 2015. The second edition was, was published in 2016. And he's here today to talk about his second book, which is coming out in March, um, which is a novel. It's called Frank's Revenge After Midnight. Hello, Don. Welcome to the show. Hello. I'm always happy to be here. This building has a has an interesting history for me. I've been coming down here doing one show or another since 2012, so mm -hmm. it's always thrilling to me to walk in the front door. Yeah. Hey, it's another good time. Mm -hmm. So I have some questions today. We're going to be talking about writing. We're going to be talking about your book, which is right here, mm -hmm. Behind the Badge in River City, a Portland Police Memoir. Um, and it's experiencing kind of a recent resurgence in sales, which is great. Yes. Um, and this last year, in October of 2018, I published my uh, short collection of, of fiction called Burnside Field Lizard and Selected Stories, which is um, also available everywhere books are sold. Um, but we're here to talk about your, your novel, your first ever um, book of fiction. Oh. And uh, before we talk about that, I have some questions sure. that I'd like to ask. Um, questions about writing. Um, so question number one, explain how the seed of your police memoir came about. Why did you need to write Behind the Badge in River City? I was angry. Mm -hmm. uh, I was mad at the police department. I was mad at the corruption of the city at the time. And uh, after letting it set for a long time, I, it just kind of boiled over and I had to write it because um, <clears throat> The city needed to know what it was like in those days. And I know now it's a long time ago. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying anything in the book is current today, but it is a history book. And it's about the corruption in the Portland police, uh, which was horrible back in the 1960s and 70s. I'm one of the few Portland police officers that actually worked for a captain who was a pimp. His name was Jim Purcell Jr. and he ran a couple of uh, after-hours whorehouses on the district I was working at the time, so there's a lot of anger in there, So, mm -hmm. but it's a reason. It's a history book now, and yeah. that's uh, one I'm very proud of because it talks about what happened in St. John's in the 60s and the Albina district that's really no longer there. Albina uh, is now what they have called gentrified, mm -hmm. so the old Albina that's in this book is not there anymore. And Probably a good reason, a good thing, it's not there anymore. But I wrote it because I was mad, and now it's a history book, and a lot of people are reading it, and it has had a resurgence, which is great. I'm happy about that. Yeah. We um, worked on it for almost three years. You wrote it initially in 1991 and 1992. Yeah. You held on to uh, one single hard copy, carried it around when you were moving, and to your oh. various homes, and we started working on it in 2012 and finally completed the final edit in 2015, oh. and it was published um, that year. I remember when we, were, when we were submitting it, we had a lot of, we had a difficult time because it's a very controversial book. It's not a pat on the back. Oh. It's a gritty account of corruption in the Portland Police Bureau, and there were some people that were angry that you had written it. Fortunately now, several years later, people are really glad that you wrote it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, most of the people are, that are in the book are deceased now, so. Mm -hmm. So, how do you write, how do you begin the process of writing? For me, it's always come out of a, a bad spot right here in the top of my head. It just kind of percolates back up in there until I can't contain it anymore. And then uh, that's the nut of the idea of what I'm going to write about. But uh, I write at night. I write in my head. Mm -hmm. And I write entire scenes. And they, I'm fortunate enough to, they seem to stay there because when I wake up, what I wrote in my, in my earlier 
time is, is still in my head, so I just get up and write it down. Mm -hmm. And from then, it's just put it on paper and, and go and go back to bed and write the next scene. So you think about yeah. things and yeah. you, you write scenes in, in your head. Totally write scenes in my head. Okay. All the dialogue, uh, the, the nuances, the, the everything that's in the scene, uh, the, the uh, maison scene, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> is all in my head. And then I get up and put it down on paper. Okay. It's either a... Uh, a talent or a blessing, you're stuck with it. You can't, you can't help, but it comes percolating out. If I can't, I can't mm -hmm. put a hole over it, mm -hmm. can't put a hat on it, mm -hmm. it just comes out. So why did you write Frank's Revenge After Midnight? This ah. is your first, um, really your first, or maybe your second attempt at fiction, um, because you have written another book that is currently not published right now. But um, why did you feel compelled to write Frank's Revenge After Midnight? Frank's Revenge After Midnight is uh, basically my lament at the loss of the old Tenderloin District. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm talking about Southwest Third Avenue, Jefferson Street, Alder, uh, that area of town where it used to be in the 60s really, really not safe for just about anybody to go in that part of town. Uh, the Old Glory was a, a nightclub of uh, bad repute. The Lotus Hotel, which is in both of my books, uh, there's actually a room number 10, and it's in the story. Room number 10 becomes uh, the office of Frank McAllister in the story, and he works out of the Lotus Hotel and lives uh, his life in the middle 70s. That's where, where it's... Uh, written in the middle 70s in Portland was at its most corrupt. 1975, I think, is, mm -hmm. is the time I used. So it's a lament about the lost part of the city that uh, I lived in, worked in, and uh, want to keep alive for future generations. And it's also kind of a, isn't it also kind of a, an exploration of really the corruption that existed, a fictional exploration of the corruption that existed in the Portland Police Bureau at that time? It is. There was a lot of, a lot of real corruption, but uh, the story centers on uh, a series of, of, uh, of murders that are not solved by the police, and uh, a person can't, the protagonist can't figure out why the police are never going to solve this murder, these murders. So that's basically what the story is about. I can uh, I'll read a little piece of it here if you want me to. Okay. Um, what well. What writer do you most admire? Ah, my wife. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you know, this, this Burnside Field Lizard book is, is going to be the new standard as far as I'm concerned, the short story writers in America. <laughs> other than that, but, uh, who was the other one we talked Your about? Your other favorite writer, James oh. Baldwin. <laughs> oh, yeah, James Baldwin, the black writer, the intellectual. He was, he was a genius in his time. I've, read just about everything he's written, and I look at all his videos, so I admire him greatly. He's amazing, and we yeah. like to w yeah. watch his videos on yeah. YouTube. Yeah. Um, so before you read a section, a passage of, of Frank's Revenge After Midnight, which is going to be coming out about March, yes. um, one more question. What are you going to do next? Are there any other books due to be released? Well, my affliction has been writing books for a long, long time, so I have uh, two books on the shelf that have not yet been published. One of them is called The Four Stories, and it's about uh, Portland from uh, the way I grew up here in the early 1950s. It's based on a lot of nostalgia about the Hollywood district and the Hollywood theater, and uh, my early ties going into the Navy, losing my virginity is one of the stories. And uh, there's another story about my time in the military when I was in the Navy in the Cold War in Germany. Uh, there's another story about uh, one of the ladies that I was involved with for a long time that was murdered in Seattle. And then there's a, the final story is a story about when I was a director of security at the Benson Hotel for six years. It's called, uh, well, I can't remember the name Benson of it. Benson House? Yeah, Benson House. Yeah. So it's a story about uh, Benson and how the Benson was built and how it was operated when I came to work for it. A wonderful hotel, a wonderful place. 
-hmm. So the four stories is what it's called. That will be the yeah. next one after Frank's Revenge. Yeah, the four stories will mm -hmm. be published by Oregon Greystone yes, Press, yes. which is who we are. And, mm -hmm. um, and the stories, there are four stories, and they're all very different. Yeah. And probably the most entertaining or comical story is the story about the Benson Hotel. Yes. Um, it's very funny, very, very funny story. Um, and then you have another book that hasn't been published. Yes, it's about a pedophile uh, that I had an opportunity to study for years. Uh, he had raped two uh, six-year-old girls during his time. I was able to interview him in the penitentiary in, in Monroe, Washington over a series of uh, a couple of years by telephone, by mail, and by personal visits. So that's a, a very tough, traumatic story mm -hmm. uh, yet to be published. And it's written as fiction? Written as fiction, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, would you like to read a section of your upcoming novel, Frank's Revenge After Midnight? Yeah, I'll read a little short piece of it here. The story starts out here. Part of the story is about the Burger Barn restaurant, which is an old uh, restaurant in the Albina ghetto, uh, which is torn down now, but will live forever in this story. A deeply rutted alley ran behind the Burger Barn. Two abandoned cars, stripped of anything valuable, blocked the alley, which was overgrown with brambles and Canadian thistle, dandelions, and a few old rose bushes leaving a path hardly wide enough to walk through. The OGs Frank would be meeting were a council of retired gangsters, wild in their youth and cautious in their old age. They could all look back on youthful recklessness, which led to long prison sentences, but now they were retired pensioners, comfortable with their existence and too old to get into trouble. Roosevelt Jenkins spent most of his youth terrorizing the electric companies in Portland and surrounding areas. This included the telephone companies and all the wire utility companies as well. With his long-handled hot stick, Roosevelt cut down a thousand feet of phone and utility copper wire in a single night. Wearing his official-looking orange utility worker's vest, he would roll up the wire and throw it in his truck, a rebuilt and rebuilt again international harvester 40-something beater. Then he would build a fire in the fireplace at his house and burn the insulation off. To add to the appearance of the used copper, he would drive over the wire with his truck a few times until he thought it looked nice and dirty and secondhand. He sold the wire to all the scrap metal dealers, some from prominent Jewish families living in Portland, and they always willing to buy it, knowing it was stolen. Over time, Roosevelt cost the utility so much money, they hired an investigator just to catch him. But he caught himself, so to speak, when on one of his excursions, he was burning insulation in the fireplace of his home, and it caught the house on fire, which burned to the ground. Charged with stealing thousands of dollars of copper wire, Roosevelt was handled down a sentence of five to ten, with time off for good behavior. But his attraction to copper wire and easy money was too much of a temptation. He was undeterred and always went back to his old line of work, copper theft. Eventually, Roosevelt was imprisoned several more times, and finally, after so many years of being in a joint, Roosevelt decided to retire. Roosevelt was Jojo's grandfather. Roosevelt's grandson had been murdered. So that's the crux of the story. Yeah. A series of unsolved murders. A series of unsolved murders. Mm -hmm. You know that uh, a private investigator, Frank McAllister, is hired to uh, to solve. So, so what's the message of Frank's Revenge After Midnight? If there is a message, what is it? Frank's Revenge has a message of uh, pretty much do the right thing. Uh, sometimes the right person will come along and do the right thing, no matter what color they are. Uh, it's about acceptance of people color and uh, their, their background. It's, it's a story about doing the right thing at the right time. And there is, uh, there is examination in this, in this novel of, of interracial relationships. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Uh, interesting examination of relationships. There's, not, uh, there's no sex in it. There's no drippy, nasty sex in it. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's all, uh, uh, how do you say that? Uh, uh, behind the lines, behind the scenes, uh, less is more. Mm -hmm. Yes, so it's very tastefully done. In fact, uh, my protagonist, 
don't even kiss. Right. <laughs> There's just the suggestion of, of future a of, intimacy. A lot of suggestions of okay. intimacy. <laughs> yeah. So, what? Um, who are who are some other favorite writers that you have that you have read that you, um, or other books that, that you've read that you've enjoyed reading? Well, <coughs> one of my first all-time heroes was Mickey Spillane. Mm -hmm. Mickey Spillane. Who wrote I the Judge, uh, <laughs> or I the Jury, mm -hmm. I the Jury. And uh, I read it when I was preparing to write Frank's Revenge, but because I thought he was pretty sexy when I read the Burke when I was a kid in my early 20s. Mm -hmm. But I look back at it now, and some of the stuff that he said in that book would never get away with ever. Mm -hmm. It's amazing, absolutely amazing. But but uh, either a judge, either jury, I mm -hmm. like that concept. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We looked at that book together. Yeah. Um, it was probably a year ago, and, and we yeah. both realized that he's actually a, a terrible writer. Terrible writer. But a great storyteller. A great storyteller, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes writers can tell great stories, and they absolutely mm -hmm. cannot write. Mm -hmm. So, um, so uh, let's talk about what it's been like getting your memoir, your police memoir, published. Um, tough. How did that feel? Tough. Um, tough? It was very tough because. It's a true story, it's an honest story, and that's a problem because I honestly accuse some Portland police officers of murder, mm -hmm. uh, killing a black youth for his drugs. In 1975? So, uh, 1975 this happened, so with that kind of a story, I could, after f I found out after a while that no publisher was going to publish anything that controversial. Mm -hmm. So it opened the opportunity uh, to self-publish because only when you self-publish can you control what you write right. and control everything. So. And that's when we came up with the name Oregon Greystone Press. Um, yep. I created that name and um, it was simply to get your police memoir out there as a very important historical document for Portland, Oregon. Mm -hmm. And then I realized that I really enjoyed publishing and we've continued with it. And um, my book Burnside Field Lizard and Selected Stories is our third book published through Oregon Greystone Press. Mm -hmm. And the fourth book will be your novel, Frank's Revenge After Midnight. We also have um, another book that will be published in 2019, um, a poetry book by uh, a Portland poet. Her name is Bethany Umbarger, and that book will be published this year as well. Um, it, w it is going to be called uh, Broken Bottle Beautiful, Poetry and Prose. Mm -hmm. So it's really exciting to kind of go beyond just publishing our own work yeah. and publishing another writer. Um, and it's very challenging learning how to do that. Um, what are some of the challenges uh, that, you, that you face when it comes to writing? Well, initially, uh, when you first start writing, you're afraid to reveal yourself. So the challenge is, is getting over yourself and just letting it all hang out. I think it was somebody famous like Hemingway who said you open a vein and bleed. And basically that's the truth. You really have to get, put yourself out there because people will realize if you're telling the truth or if you're padding the truth or if you're just full of BS. Mm -hmm. So that's the hard part is being honest with yourself and letting it all hang out, let the chips fall where they may. What was your message? What was your reasoning behind um, writing Touched, which is the fictional book you wrote, which is no. almost 400 pages about the pedophile that you interviewed and studied no. and got to know. Uh, very challenging because it's, uh, what I started out to do with Touched was, was to find out how, how this young boy uh, grew up like I did and we, he, be, he, went to, he became a pedophile and went to prison and I became a policeman. How did, how did our upbringing change? What, what was the influence, and that's what, that's what that book was really about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And all the horrors that uh, it went through with yeah. his children who were raped. And, and, and he was also an abused child. He was an abused, severely abused child yeah. by his uh, military mother and his military father, you know, yeah. seriously abused. Yep. Okay, so you've got some books coming up. You've got two books that we're going to publish mm -hmm. after we publish Frank's Revenge After Midnight. 
Uh, mm -hmm. I want to thank you for being on today's show. Um, this has been another episode of TV Toastmasters, and I hope that our listening audience joins us again. Um, these are wonderful videos that uh, are shot here in Portland at Open Signal that give people the opportunity to share um, their professions, their loves, art, literature. So thank you again for watching this episode of TV Toastmasters. My name is Teresa Griffin Kennedy, and uh, my guest today is Don Dupe, who is also my husband. Thank you again. Welcome to an opportunity to take the next step of your professional speaking journey. I want you to be honest with yourself. Have you ever wished you were a star in a television show or at an event where the media is interviewing bystanders and you are wanting to be picked to give your opinion of the event? Or even in the smallest sense, you're at a sports game and secretly hope that your smiling face would appear on that big jumbo screen TV but the jumbo screen always finds the fans with the painted faces. And you think to yourself, maybe next time. Well, what if I can offer you a chance to be on TV? Would you take it? That is what I want to offer you now. I'm Dottie Love, Associate TV Producer and Director. Toastmasters International is one of the largest organizations whose mission is to help improve your speaking skills. And District 7 is expanding your opportunities to do speaking via television. We have four fully equipped television studios and TV Toastmaster broadcasts to over 500,000 homes, plus a YouTube channel. Who knew? We want to invite you to take advantage of using media and television, either in front or behind the scenes. Let me share a few options that you have. First, you can be a guest on a show. Highlight your business or a hobby or your community interest. Anything you're passionate about, be a featured guest. Secondly, you can train to be a host on an ongoing TV segment. We will train you for that. Third, what about creating your own talk show? We will train you in, for that as well and give you access to a community media studio to do just that. Or lastly, be behind the scenes, either running a camera or editing shows. You decide which avenue is best for you and our TV Toastmasters team will help you to navigate to get the most out of your media experience. Personally, I've done them all. I started as a guest, went from to hosting, up to directing my own TV show. I don't tell you this to impress you. I tell you this to impress upon you that your personal growth with Toastmasters is directly related to what you take advantage of. And I encourage you to be bold in looking for opportunities to stretch and grow. If this intrigues you, or if you have club members who you think that might be interested in this, please contact us here at TV Toastmasters. I'm Dottie Love, and you can reach me or any of us in the TV Toastmasters family at the contact information at the bottom of the screen. You can also find us on the web our website is 7512.toastmastersclub.org. Hi, I'm Deb Hart. I'd just like to share with you how appreciative I am of being able to be a TV Toastmaster host. I get to share stories within the community, have people come on the show and educate the viewers, and talk about a subject that I'm very familiar with, and that's health. I encourage you to come aboard and be a part of our TV Toastmasters Host Club. It's fun. You'll have a good time. Have a story that others need to hear? Seeking an audience for your message? 
Have an experience that can transform the lives of others? Practice your message and perfect its delivery in a TV studio while creating content for regional, national, and international exposure. That's right, get seen by an ever-increasing audience. Visit TV Toastmasters. Ken Coombs here speaking about TV Toastmasters. As an area director, I see more value in that venue than perhaps some of you do, so I want to share that. Providing a televised voice for District 7, its clubs, and their members not only gives people a chance to come here and get a project ticked off that says speak on television, it gives contestants in an area contest or a division or a district contest at least a chance to come and practice and see what they look like. It gives people a chance to share an important message with the district, whatever that might be. So consider your next speech perhaps being on television. Not your 15 minutes of fame, but your chance to reach a broader audience. <laughs> I joined Toastmasters to improve my speaking, listening, communication, and leadership skills. Toastmasters gave me incredible confidence. 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 Great listening skills. Poise. Great leadership skills. Leadership skills. The ability to speak in public. Strength. A captive audience. Quality feedback from the more experienced Toastmasters. Toastmasters really helped me improve my listening skills. Sales skills opportunities to go to different groups and widen my whole horizon. Toastmasters has given me a better, a more focused me, and I'm a much better listener. Toastmasters is fulfilling. It's a great place to fail your way to success. Wonderful way to meet people. Networking. Strength. It's addictive. It's a club of self-improvement. It's an experience, it's a ride that you won't forget and you'll enjoy it every step of the way. Toastmasters helped me land a kick butt job. I sang at one of my table topic speeches and people liked it and applauded. It. My business is doing great and I'm very, very grateful to Toastmasters. It's been a great experience for me. Thank you, Toastmasters. Thank you, Toastmasters. Thank you, Toastmasters, for giving me so much confidence. Thank you, Toastmasters, for everything.